Network. This is a brief overview of my own work. Carl Weiderquist, born 1965, the first person we studied who's still alive. Well, actually not true. No, we several other people studied several other people who are still alive. Um, I'm best known as an advocate for the policy of basic income. Uh, basic income is the idea of putting a floor under everyone's income. So you've got a little money coming in every day or week or month, whether you're rich or poor, no matter what else is true about it, you've got a little money coming in every week or month or year. And uh, one of the reasons that I believe this is that it's, it's wrong for anyone to come between you and the resources you need to survive. But I'm also arguing for basic income from a certain perspective that I didn't find very much in the basic income literature before I came along. Some elements of my perspective, uh, what, what I'm calling my perspective, I, I can trace as far back as Thomas Paine in the 1790s. Um, but uh, I haven't heard it stressed very much before I came along, but it's really the centerpiece of my argument for basic income is the idea that, uh, well, probably these two things put together, this idea that effectively, by creating a monetary society where some don't have resources and others do, we are coming between people and the resources they need to survive in a way that our ancestors didn't, in the way that we were once all free to go out into the wilderness and uh, use and live off the land. We're no longer free to do that. And we could hunt and gather and fish and farm. That's no longer free. But what we've taken away with people is not only we've taken away their ability to meet their own livelihood and created the status of poverty, the status of economic destitution or homelessness, but then we've given people no reasonable option other than working for wealthier people to keep themselves alive. And that puts all of us, all of us who don't begin the world as a very wealthy person, in the position where we cannot say no to employment. We can say no to one employer, but the only way we can say no to one employer is to find another employer to say yes to. But to object to the employment system and say, no, none of these jobs are worth my time is wrong. So this perspective that freedom is the power to say no. And by denying people access to the resources they need to survive, we have taken away every individual's power to say no to the more powerful people in society is really the basics of my perspective. But basic income is not all that I've written about and not all that I care about. This is what I'm best known for. Let me give you sort of an overview of the theory that comes in with this, is that I have been for the last 15 years trying to work out my own basic theory of justice. You know, Rawls calls his justice is fairness or um, liberal egalitarianism knows it cause, calls his version of right libertarianism entitlement theory. You're familiar with social contract theory and utilitarianism. Well, Carl Weiderquist's theory of justice is called justice as the pursuit of a core. And it's an alternative to contractarian, constructivist, and right libertarian theories of justice. It is one that attempts to be over the top in humaneness, that what we're lacking in our other political theories is, is being really extra humane to those who are the least advantaged and those who are outsiders, even Rawls, who has an entire theory based around maximizing the advantage of the least advantage. I believe Rawls incorporates very negative ideas about the least advantage that allow more powerful people to take advantage of them into his theory. Contractarian and constructive theories either assume agreement exists or assume conditions under which individuals should agree. So Hobbes assumes that the alternative to the state is so terrible that everyone would agree to any state that keeps them alive. And that then allows the powerful people in the state to push around the less powerful people. And, and they could just tell themselves how great they are. They could, they could go and colonize other countries and say, those are naked savages who live 
lives that are solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short, we can just go take them over and we're doing them a favor. And it allows you to mistreat the people in your own society. As you look down on them and say, well, we saved you for being naked savages. Sure, you're a day laborer who's getting really low pay, but you're so much better off than those naked savages in the state of nature that no matter, really, no matter how bad we mistreat you, um, you, we're still really doing you a favor by giving you the advantages of civil society. Um, Rawls says, you know, Rawls, I think, takes a, a big step forward on this, on this uh, idea, but what he, by not saying that, that look, we've got to just pick this horrible alternative and say, look, you're better off than that, that's good enough. What Rawls wants to do is to look at all the possible alternatives and say, we've got to pick the one that's most advantageous to the least advantage. And like, well, what, what could possibly be disadvantageous to the least advantage when you're saying we're going to look at all the different social arrangements and pick the one that's, that's best for them? But the thing what he does is to justify being part of society, he says that you have to be a worker for that society, is that society is a mutual project for a shared goal, a shared project for a mutual benefit, is that we're all working together. And we enter this project as people who are working together. And that what justifies your consideration for being somebody who's going to, to whom the, dis the difference principle is going to be applied is that you are contributing to this system. So you have to be a contributor. And those who don't contribute, those lazy people who surf all day off of Malibu, he says, that's his idea of a disadvantaged person that doesn't want a job. These persons are being lazy and try to overconsume too much leisure. That if you refuse to work for the system, you're consuming too much leisure. You're taking leisure away from other people. Um, and these people should get nothing. So you don't even get consideration in Rawls unless you are a worker or willing to work and can prove that you're unable to work, say you're disabled or something. Um, so, uh, so he incorporates these, real, these, these assumptions and these assumptions greatly disadvantage the least advantaged people. Well, you say you don't get anything unless you're willing to work. Well, it is the upper class people who are deciding what the jobs are and how much they pay. And they're using their imagination to say, oh, we've applied the difference principle. We're making everybody better off. But Hobbes was using his imagination when he decided that his system made every, everyone better off. The slaveholders were using their imagination when they, uh, they imagined that slavery was good for everyone. Okay, so I have five people here who don't have their videos on. You're not gonna get participation credit uh, without the video. Uh, so please get your videos on. Um, so, so there's these disadvantageous thoughts here. And so right libertarian theories insist strictly on consent. But consent applies in right libertarianism from John Locke through Robert Nozick and after, that this consent applies only after a one-sided distribution of property rights is in place. You know, first, we're going to divide the world into property. Some people are going to get property, some aren't. That doesn't involve consent. That's appropriation. And appropriation doesn't involve consent. We don't need your consent. So some people start off with everything, others start off with nothing. And only then are we going to say strictly we don't do anything without individual consent. But you've already put the least advantage in a position where they can't say no. They have no power to say no because they have no access to the resources they need to survive. So it's very one-sided. So they talk great about agreement in social contract theory, and they talk about consent and natural rights theory, but they don't deliver it. So my alternative, justice of the pursuit of accord, is the idea that consent is really important. What we really would like 
is a society that is really based on the consent of the government, the universal agreement to everyone to the basic structure of society, but we're never going to get it. Unanimous consent, even among all rational, reasonable, and fully informed people, is not going to happen. What will happen is some privileged group of people will take power in society. And they will tell themselves that they're being great to everybody else, but if they're not conceding power to everyone else, they're not doing very good. So what we have to do is to maximize the number of people who we can truly bring into accord to who they really think this is a just society. And then we've got to realize that there are people that we have left out. And these people are overwhelming, going to be the political outsiders, the disadvantaged, the minority groups of one type or another. The people who are left out have reasonable objections that we can't just dismiss them by saying all their objections are unreasonable, or they just want to violate our rights, or they are, are being unreasonable in saying they want a social contract that's biased in their favor. No, actually, probably these disadvantaged people have been mistreated by the inside. So we have to, we have to minimize the negative effects on all of the most outside people. And to do this, we're going to have to concede them power. We have to find a way to concede power to the least advantaged people. Let me talk about some of my articles that I've written over the years. Um, my first published article was way back in the 20th century. It was called Reciprocity and the Guaranteed Income, where I argue in that article that the way we've uh, distributed property in the United States and really in just about every country in the world is not reciprocal. That is, it doesn't embody the idea that if I'm gonna burden myself, I need to burden you as well. And if you're gonna burden me, you have to burden yourself as well. You can't have one side takes on the burdens and another side gets the benefits. That's what we've done with the property rights system. Those who have property have gotten all the benefits of the property rights system. Those who have no property, have not. Um, and what we need to do to create a reciprocal property rights system, one that actually embodies the value of reciprocity is that everyone must get a share. So those who have larger shares of property owe compensation back to those who didn't get a share in the form of a universal basic income. This is its own argument for basic income. It's its own standalone argument for basic income is that we have to do it to, to create a property rights system that is not one-sided and therefore, therefore unethical. But also it works as a response to those who say that basic income is something for nothing. It is the farthest thing in the world of something for nothing. The property rights system we have now is something for nothing, where people can own resources without, without other people getting a share of resources and without compensating those who didn't get a share when you grab your share of the resources. So basic income is not something for nothing. It is your compensation for the fact that somebody long ago divided resources and gave everyone else a share and you didn't get one. Uh, and, and the year 2005, in my skills as an economist, I uh, published a paper called A Failure to Communicate, What, if anything, can we learn from negative income tax experiments? <laughs> this, um, this, is, uh, th this paper is um, a technical look at what experiments in policies like basic income are able to tell us and what they are not able to tell us. Um, in my 2006 paper, Who Exploits Who, I look more into this issue of can a basic income exploit people. In my 2009 article, A Dilemma for Libertarianism, um, I argue that libertarianism, as Robert Nozick and people like him portray it, um, they really have no argument against the government ownership of property. That uh, if an individual can, can appropriate property and make him an owner, an individual can appropriate property and make herself the queen of England 
or a group of people can appropriate property and make themselves the owner of a republic. That there is nothing about this right libertarian ideology that really separates the institution of government from the institution of private property. Private properties are just like little governments. We got rid of the government as some right libertarians want. Um, then our uh, landowners would simply be smaller governments. And those of us without land would be just as much subject to government as we are now. Um, and other, pro other papers I have, I won't go through all of these Lockean theories. Property, the physical basis of voluntary trade, why we demand an unconditional basic income. Um, and to talk about my perspective, I will talk about several of my books. My 2013 book, Independence, Populousness, and Basic Income, A Theory of Freedom is the Power to Say No. I'm going to spend a lot of time on that book. That book um, is where I begin, I begin outlining my theory of justice. A forthcoming book called Justice of the Pursuit of, Acc of Accord, I haven't written yet, but that one I will further uh, outline my theory of justice. Uh, but before I get to the books on my theory of justice, I will talk about two other books, my 2017 book, Prehistoric Myths and Modern Political Philosophy and The Prehistory of Private Property, where I debunk existing theories, kind of paving the way for me writing my own theory. So the prehistory of prehistoric myths and modern political philosophy. This book looks at the claim that is common to and to Hobbes that society needs to be mutually beneficial to be justified and mutual benefit has been achieved. That, that uh, we have societies that are mutual benefic mutually beneficial because we're all so much better off than we would be in the state of nature. Hobbes said this in order to justify the government and Locke said this in order to justify the private property rights system. So they use it for two very different theories. Locke used it in his famous proviso that in order to appropriate property, you can do so providing everyone else has enough and is good, which is, tra is translated into meaning no one's worse off now than they are or would be in a society without property rights. And John Locke says, that's John Locke. And then Thomas Hobbes says that the state can be imposed on you if it makes you better off than you are in the state of nature. And because the state of nature is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short, we are all better. So what my co-author Grant Call and I do in this book is we go through these theories to say, do they really mean it? Are they really saying that everyone is better off in contemporary society than they are in far away societies today that don't have property rights or the, or the state, and or better off than people who lived thousands of years ago in the many societies that have had neither property rights nor the state government. And we spent a lot of time looking at contemporary theories that are contract theories like John Rawl, like, like, like Thomas, Thomas Hobbes. Uh, contemporary people include uh, Gautier, Hampton, uh, uh, many others that are writing today. We look at their theories and show, yes, they are making the same claim. John Rawls is not. John Rawls is making a different claim. Uh, in this book, we have really nothing negative to say about John Rawls. Uh, in, uh, but, and also people like Robert Nozick and other contemporary followers of Locke are continuing to make this claim that everyone is better off in a state society with private property rights than they they are in these other societies that have existed throughout the world. They really are saying this, and they really need this claim to be true for their theories to work. Then we look at the anthropological evidence. We look at the evidence throughout history and find that there is very good evidence that not only are these claims doubtful, they are false. That the worst off people in our societies today, the sweatshop workers, who make our clothing, the janitors in Doha 
that clean that clean our that clean our beautiful campus for us. Uh, the meat packers in the United States, the fruit pickers in the United States who bring who, who bring us our food in the country are not better off than their ancestors were thousands of years ago. Society has not made them better off. We've told ourselves that we have mutual advantage and we've lied to ourselves. And by lying to ourselves, we've justified colonization of distant people and mistreatment of the people in our own society. When we, when we, we claim mutual advantage, but we fail to achieve it. And a society that fails to achieve mutual advantage is a parasitic society, a society that benefits some at the expense of others. And the only way to stop being a parasitic society is to treat the least advantaged people in our society much better than we're treating them. That's the point of this book. My most recent book, A Prehistory of Private Property, which I shouldn't even call a recent book because it's not actually out yet. Um, this book is gonna be out any day. It's due out in February, 2021. I'm expecting a copy of it to arrive in the mail any day when I can take a picture of it and post it for all my friends. Um, it's called The Prehistory of Private Property. And what we do is we look at what life was like before the private property system was created and how the private property system was imposed to falsify three other common claims about the private property system. One is the claim that, e ine that inequality is simply natural and inevitable, or that equality is in conflict with freedom, that you really aren't gonna achieve equality, or if you do, you'll achieve it at the expense of liberty. We look at that claim. Uh, we look at the claim that, um, that a capitalist society is more consistent with negative liberty than any other society. And we look at the claim that there's something natural about the right to private property, that private property develops through appropriation, and that it is a natural right that humans will uh, create whenever they are able to do. And we look at all three of these claims and the find that they're all false, that there are societies known to anthropology that have no private property system and actually are freer than our own society in, in many ways. And these societies are also very equal. And so this argument that we can't have equality because it's impossible is simply false or the, argue, the idea that equality is in conflict with negative liberty is simply false. And the way the property rights system developed, and we go from the earliest times from prehistory through ancient Egypt, Mesopotamia, Greece and Rome, early China, uh, uh, the, the uh, empires of the Americas, right through to the present day and show how the private property system has gradually developed around the world and was still confined mostly to cities in Europe as recently as 500 years ago. It's spread around the world since then by two, and, it, and before then it developed from the top down by kings creating it for themselves and then their families and then for high placed officials and only got around to ordinary people very gradually and slowly. And in as recently as four or 500 years ago, property rights as we know them today were confined mostly to the cities in Europe. And they spread from there in two ways. Within Europe, by something called the enclosure movement, when they took peasant villages where peasants were sharing the land and the Lord was a governor in the land. And they said, oh, that Lord, he's not really a government official. He's a private landlord. He's owned the land all the time. We're kicking all you off. You're gonna be his tenant if you're lucky. Otherwise, you can go to the city and look for a job. We don't really give a crap what happens to you. Um, so we, in Europe, basically there was no appropriation in Europe. There was a government throwing the workers off the land to benefit somebody who had never worked the land. In the rest of the world, we had the colonial movement, where in most of the world there was no private property rights system, but there was nomadic, there were nomadic hunter-gatherers or nomadic herders in some areas, and peasant agriculture, not unlike that communal peasant agriculture in Europe around most of the world, European colonialists and their indigenous successors once the Europeans left 
went around the world creating the private property system by seizure and violence. So the private property system is not a system of natural liberty, like Adam Smith called it, but it is a system that has been imposed on people through a system of violence. And all of this implies that we can make the world freer and more equal by redistribution to the least advantaged people in our society. So in these books, I reject social contract theory and I reject, I reject natural rights theory of private property, which explains, well, well, then what is your theory of justice? And that I begin to outline in my book, Independence, Properlessness, and Basic Income, A Theory of Freedom of as a power to say no. The title of that book is a huge mouthful. I wanted to call the book Freedom as the Power to Say No. And my publisher didn't like that title. They're like, oh no, we need keywords in the title. So we'll put that in the subtitle. And, and so I got this really long, this really long title. But there you go. You make compromises with the publisher. So this book, this book, which came out in 2013, is an exploration of what I call independentarianism or justice as the pursuit of the court. That's my theory of justice. But it's, it is only an exploration of the independentarian theory of freedom, not the overall it, 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 independentarian theory of everything else. My later book, which I'm working on now or soon, will apply JPA to the, prop, to the property rights system and to legal authority. How do you justify a private property rights system if I've rejected the social contract and the, and the natural rights justifications of private property? How can I justify the property rights system consistently with this theory of justice as a chord that I'm doing? That's the project for the later book. One of the things I look at in freedom is the power to say no, is the idea that we look at freedom in two ways. We look at freedom as you can be more free or less free, but we also look at freedom as you can be freed or you can be enslaved or imprisoned. What is it, or oppressed? What is the difference between a free person and an oppressed person? Your status freedom. And that's what this book focuses on, is what does it mean to respect a person's status as a free person. And what I come up with is that your status as a free person is having effective control self-ownership. Just owning yourself is not enough. Effective, owning yourself without owning enough resources to keep yourself alive is ineffective, and therefore it can be very nearly worthless. Um, effective control self-ownership is the effective power to accept or refuse active cooperation with other willing people. It is freedom as the power to say no. This both involves narrowing and broadening the concept of self-ownership. So self-ownership is the idea that I own me, but I own nothing else. And I own everything there is about me. Uh, what I say is that what's most important at the core of self-ownership is control self-ownership, that I control my actions. I decide what I do. Um, so in that sense, it's narrower in this broader conception that I owe, own every hair that falls out of my head, um, or I own the absolute right to all the income that I can ever make with my body, is that I have the right to make decisions about myself. That is the core of self-ownership. But this core is not very valuable unless it's effective. To be effective, you must have access to the resources that you need to survive. If somebody came to the room that you're in and said, I respect you as a self-ownership, as a self-owner, but you don't own the atmosphere. I'm appropriating the atmosphere. I'm sucking all the air out of the room that you're in, and you're not going to breathe unless you buy the air from me, the owner of the atmosphere, or one of the competing owners of the atmosphere. You're going to be dead in six minutes, so you better cough up some money pretty quick. You'd be pretty upset about that, and I think you'd realize you would be an unfree person because you could not say no to working for the people who own the atmosphere. Well, we are and have been for the last few hundred years in the same position relative to the people who own the ground. 
We cannot keep ourselves alive unless we work for one of them. Unless you are part of that group and you own enough of the Earth's surface that you can live off your assets. Unless you're part of that group, you are unable to say no to working for a member of that group. You can borrow, you can steal, or you can work for one of them. The only really legal way to keep yourself alive is to work for somebody who owns the resources you need to survive. And it should not be that way. And it cannot be that way if we are going to respect each other's status as free people. That's where I argue with effective control of self-ownership. And believe me, being propertyless is a state of unfreedom. There's a very good essay on this called Homelessness and the Issue of Freedom by Jeremy Waldron, which I recommend highly, where he points out that homeless people are unfree in the most liberal, negative sense of the term, and unfree in some of their most basic functions. They're unfree to sleep undisturbed. Very often they are unfree to sleep in a warm, safe place. They're unfree to wash themselves, unfree to find a private place to urinate. And what Waldron doesn't say, but what I add to this is that they're unfree to use, to use the resources of the earth to keep themselves alive. Look at this picture. This person is foraging. This person is foraging for food. They're not foraging in the woods. They're not foraging by fishing in the Gulf. They are not foraging in the savannas. They are foraging in someone else's garbage because their opportunity to forage in the wilderness has been taken away. Their opportunity to farm for themselves, their opportunity to become a fisherman has been taken away. All of this has been taken away. And the only foraging opportunity left to this person is in someone else's garbage. I tell you, it's a lot better to forage for yourself by going out and fishing in one of our rivers that's now polluted than it is to forage in somebody else's garbage. But these are the opportunities we give to the powerless. We make it impossible for them to build their own shelters and to provide their own food and make them therefore dependent on the wealthier people who can employ them. Destitution is not a fact of nature. When resources are available, people are not destitute. You can say a lot about how poorly off Native peoples are, and, and compared to wealthy people in our societies today, yes, they are not well off. However, um, they are also not destitute the way homeless people are destitute. Economic destitution is the result of the laws we've made for property. It is not a fact of nature. For millions of years, our ancestors were free to meet their own needs without answering to a boss. You did not have to get a job to survive for millions of years. And a few people in remote places today are still in that position where they do not have to go to a boss to keep themselves alive and say, I will follow your orders if you'll pay me enough that I can buy food to keep myself alive. Our ancestors and those few brethren today of ours that are living in places where they can still forage, live without interference for anyone, without following anyone else's orders. And that is a freedom that our societies have taken away from everyone else. We took away those freedoms from the poorest people in our societies and we gave them no compensation in return. The picture I show here is a picture of Native Americans shortly after they were forced off of the prairies where they'd been keeping themselves alive by their own efforts for 10,000 years at least, maybe 20,000 years. They'd been forced off the prairie, given no compensation for the loss of the land, and here they are coming to an American military outpost and having to beg for supplies to keep themselves alive. That is what we have done to people who could be keeping themselves alive. We've created, by doing this, we've created the work or starve principle. 
Individuals are forced into a state of property. The only legal means to survive is to get an owner to give you access to the resources you need to survive. You can work for them. You can marry one of them. You can beg from them. And that's really all your only options that are legal. You can steal, but that's illegal. For most of us, this means work or starve. We have no other realistic opportunity. And people do starve. People do die of exposure. People die from eating other people's garbage. And people die of malnutrition because they are unwilling or unable to take jobs for someone else that are available in society. And sometimes they take the jobs and still die from malnutrition or something else because the jobs pay so poorly and the jobs can pay so poorly because the starting point that we've created for the lower class is so low that jobs can pay poverty wages and get plenty of people to work for them year after year. And we're all benefiting from that. All those of us who are here in this class are benefiting from the work that other people are doing. This worker starve the outcome is worker starve the outcome of nature or of human force. And I've been as what you can tell from arguing here is it is it is the outcome of human force. Humans through the enclosure movement in Europe and the colonial movement elsewhere gradually forced people off the land, gave the land to the wealthiest people, and put everyone else in this position where they must work or starve. Um, today, work equals working for a property owner. We don't think of work as being any other kind, unless you're going into a job and taking orders. We don't even consider that to be work. But in the past, work meant working for yourself. There, we don't need a boss to be a worker. To be for, to be to be a worker in the modern sense of taking a job is a newly created status that was created by colonialism. Well, uh, it was created internally in some areas. That uh, uh, it uh, doesn't exchange. It it wasn't created just by the colonial movement, but it was it was brought to the remotest areas in the world by the colonial movement. Today is illegal for the property for, for a propertyist person to work for themselves. Work today means working for a property owner. That means accepting a subordinate position and taking orders. The acceptance of wages and working conditions that might be ridiculously low and give you an extremely small share of what our society is producing. Forced performance of labor is not freedom. It's not the same. When I say that workers today are in this position of worker star, I do not mean that they are just as bad off as American slaves were before 1865. No, they're not that bad off, at least not in most areas but they are not well off enough that we can say they're genuinely free people. Um, to be a truly free person is to be somebody who decides whether I will work for someone else or not, not someone who has a choice of masters. A choice of masters is better than being owned by one master, but a choice of masters is not genuine freedom either. I take a line from Joseph Heller in the book Catch-22, this whole program is voluntary. The men don't have to if they don't want to, but we need you to starve them to death if they don't. And this is something outlined in the book and in my article, The Physical Basis of Voluntary Trade, is that we have created a situation where people are physically incapable of, of voluntary trade because their needs are not met. They must trade. We are forcing them into trade. And then we were telling ourselves that this is what free trade is. That free trade is when some people start off with nothing and they go and bargain with the people have something as if they were equal. And they agree to work for them. Well, if you agree to work for somebody because you've been put in a position where you have no other reasonable choice, there's, there is no voluntary trade in this exchange, but yet this, we tell ourselves, we have convinced ourselves, we create an entire world economy where we pretend that this is voluntary trade. And clearly it cannot be when you think about it. 
Our societies have taken away the power to say no from individuals who an whose ancestors had it for millions of years. And so my question, the last part of the book is how we can restore that stolen power. And the answer is that is the connection of basic income. The power to say no could be ensured by direct access to resources, but, but taking the seven or eight billion people who live on this planet today and giving each one of those people direct access to enough resources to survive is simply not realistic. To do that for the, what is it, 12 million people that live in Islamabad, you're gonna give every one of those 40 acres and a mule so they can live by their own efforts to the 25 million people that live in Tokyo uh, where there is very little available land anywhere near there and what land is available is on mountainsides that won't make good farming. Um, it's simply not realistic to give all of the 8 billion people around the world direct access to the resources they need to survive. We could do it in goods, give people a house, give people food and shelter and clothing, but that's a very dodgy and inefficient way to do it and often demeaning to the people you give it to, or we could do it in cash. So the argument, central argument for basic income is that by through the colonial movement and the enclosure movement, we have created a world of haves and have nots and we maintain it till this day where the haves control the resources of the earth, the have nots control nothing. And because they control nothing, they do not even control themselves and become subject to themselves. What we need to do is to compensate those who have nothing in cash. And that cash must be large enough that they can live decently and have the power to say no to those who say you must work for me or starve. So uh, you can work for them if you want to, if wealthy people then with what they have left over offer you a, a job that can afford you the luxuries that you want to take the job, that is free trade. Free trade begins when everyone has enough to live without following somebody's orders. And then if you want somebody to follow your orders, you reward them with more luxury. That is a free trade society. So I envision a society where you pay for the resources that you own and you get paid for the resources that everybody else, else owns. And you can live just off of what you're getting paid for the resources everyone else owns. And if you choose to do more work and then earn a lot of luxuries, that's your reward. Those luxuries you get a reward, more power to you. Nice, self-interested, enterprising behavior. Uh, and uh, I talk about this throughout my book. Here's the table of contents for the book. Um, and I kind of go over the, uh, in these slides, go over the book. That is the basic idea of this book. In the next book, I look at, well, if you, I look at, well, how then should you distribute property in a world where you admit that there is no natural right to property. I have one basic idea of property that those who own property are gonna to have to compensate those who don't. But how do you decide who owns? How do you distribute that? What would be a fair way to do that? An ethical way to do it? That's what I do in my second book. So that's my brief introduction to my theory of justice as the pursuit of accord and the independentarian ideology that goes with it. Um, do I have any questions? I see I have, um, I have one chat, one person saying something like that. Uh, in UBI, does each citizen get a share? Yes. Um, yes. A true UBI system is one where, um, is a one where everyone, rich or poor, gets, gets a share of the universal basic income. Um, you could have a system where you, where you only gave people who didn't have enough property on their own, um, and that would avoid paying the rich and taxing the rich at the same time. But actually, it, it, it sounds like it would save trouble, but actually it creates more trouble than it, than it solves by, by giving it only to those in need. Because if you give it only to those in need, at every moment of every day, you have to know who's in need and who's, who isn't, and how much are they in need. Well, it's not easy to know who's in need and who isn't at every moment. If you have a basic income, it's always there. Um, and it's less stigmatizing. If it's 
<coughs> excuse me, if it's given to everyone. <coughs> excuse me. Wow, lately it's like I can't teach a class without sneezing. Okay, I have another class from uh, Charu. Uh, professor, I watched your video. Uh, I think it was in New York where you talked yeah. about a university basic income. Uh, so mm -hmm. I heard you said that um, the resources that the uh, top, you know, that those who earn a lot own should be shared within uh, uh, ordinary people. By resources, did you mean like uh, natural resources or anything like capital, everything that they own? Well, uh, I certainly don't mean their resources in sense in sense of, of their 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 talents and their body parts and things like that. Uh, but all property is made out of resources. So I'm talking about the resources and the property that we make out of it. And all property, even intangible property, is made out of resources. Your your uh, your incorporeal wealth. Um, that you might store on the, on the cloud, the things that you've written, those are all stored with energy. And it takes a great deal of energy and a lot of hardware and a lot of land to store all of those things. Uh, so all property is made of resources. So um, that means all property is subject to taxation for, for the support of a basic income. Okay, any other questions on my uh, idea? It's a pretty controversial, is a pretty controversial um, theory of justice, more controversial than some of the ones I've outlined for you already. Uh, so any other questions about it? Okay, Shahru. I had another question regarding this. So um, yeah. if we allocate a certain amount of money uh, to all the citizens of a certain country mm -hmm. as universal basic income, um, what about the uh, infrastructures that go to the, you know, to the country itself, for example, uh, hospitals, um, mm -hmm. building roads, everything? Yeah, well, um, what I have argued is that the net cost of providing a basic income for every American at the poverty line, the net cost of it. So when you, you, one of the things that's important to understand about basic income is that you're giving people money, you're giving people money and taxing them and taking it back in taxes at the same time. There are very few people who are not paying any taxes at all and are just receiving their basic income. For almost everybody, there's some give and take. And there are lots of people who are paying taxes that are way larger than their basic income. So when you take into account, once you take into account how much people are paying themselves, that is, I think, between three and six dollars. Uh, when I estimated it for the UK, it for uh, it was uh, it was it was uh, three to one for every dollar that was actually redistributed for someone who has to someone who has not. There were three dollars that people were just paying themselves. And in the United States, when I did estimates, it was six to one because of the different levels that I was estimating, but also the different makeups of the two economies. Six dollars that you're just paying to themselves. When you look at the net cost, it's something in the neighborhood of three percent of GDP if you just want to barely eliminate poverty. If you go to a higher one, if you go to a higher one uh, of about $20,000 a year for an adult in the United States and $10,000 for a child, which is, I think, really gonna safely get people out of poverty. Uh, if you go to that one, that would cost 10% of GDP. Well, current government spending in a lot of countries is, is 30, 40% of GDP. Um, so it is still, quite small in relation to existing government spending, a lot of that other government spending won't be so necessary because that's causing problems that are, that's solving problems that are caused by homelessness. 
So there's plenty of money left over to go for the rest of infrastructure. And there's plenty of money left over to reward people with luxuries who want to build that infrastructure and who want to build the rest of society. So basic income is just one part of a just society, a good infrastructure and hospitals, hospitals, roads, public transit, communication systems, all of those are also parts of the infrastructure of a really good society. Basic income is not all there is to social justice. It is uh, just merely something we can build on. Um, okay, Yasmin asks in the, uh, in the chat function, what about the incentive to work? Um, yes, I'm uh, very concerned about, the, about work incentives and what incentives we have. Right now, we have we have way we have horrible incentives in the economy right now because what we have right now is a part of the working class. We have a great incentive to work where we're going to starve them to death if they don't work. But we also have a terrible incentive for employers to pay good wages because they know people are going to they can pay really crap wages and. Uh, they can pay really crap wages and people will still work from them. The people who clean the toilets in, who clean the toilets in uh, Georgetown make less than a dollar an hour and they come and they leave their own home for years at a time to work for a dollar an hour. Why don't, why don't, we pay more to these people because we have a bad incentive to pay more. If you have basic income and everyone's needs are met, you give employers the incentive to pay good wages. And there's plenty of room. What about the incentives to work? What incentive will people have to work? That's what luxuries are for. Luxuries are for incentives. Necessities are for everyone. Employers, can give you that's a, if employers want to give you the want to give you an incentive to work they need to give you a good salary with good wages and good working conditions to make you want to take that job not starve you until you have to take it but make you want it so there's plenty of room for incentive to work and they're called luxuries